And in the spirit of Women's Month and Heritage Month, our personality is a woman that we all grew up watching from greetings from our board. And <laughs> some of us whose parents are abroad will cross our fingers to see if our parents will make it to her interview. And today, she's here with us to share her story with us so that we will all be inspired by her journey. Throughout the conversation with her, if you have any questions, let us know with the hashtag Breakfast Daily. And the WhatsApp line is 0550 If you're outside Ghana, the country code is plus 233. I'm talking about Nana Hema Ajoa Awendo. And she is the a developmental queen mother and the executive director of Obapa Development Foundation. But we all know her from greetings from abroad. Good morning, Nana Hema. Good morning, Stina. How are you? I'm good. Looking Oh, thank you. Thank you. You too. I love all your beats. Oh, okay. But we have to offer you a drink. So our, our friends from EUF are going to come on hey. set and give you a, some nice drink there. Thank you. Thank you. So, so much. which one is this? It's the uh, Atagi Ginger. Oh, Atagi okay. and Ginger. So. It has all the uh, calabash of goodness. Yes. <laughs> calabash of goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Now. Thank you. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Where did you grow up? What was life like as a child? Okay, so where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, a daughter of two educationists, okay. retired. And so um, I started uh, growing up in different towns and villages. My mom was teaching then, my daddy was teaching and they were at New York uh, uh, cities. So I remember uh, I was born in Sichu Dumasi in ah. Ashanti region where my mom was teaching, but subsequently she traveled to uh, other places. I started primary school um, in Atridia, in Asante Achim. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Kwasu, my daddy's hometown, to also continue with my grandmother. That was wow. a very good experience of one year. What was life like with your grandmother? It was nice. What That's where I learned how to go to the farm. Ah. Um, I remember I was crossing rivers with those logs, you know, on it. How, how did um, you make it through? A balancing act. Did you ever fall? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. You'll be taught how to do it. Okay. You know, so, and, and it came naturally those days. And you can actually carry loads and on still. That. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we did wow. it effortless, effortlessly, you know. <laughs> so, and, and it was a very good experience. And I thank my dad for that experience because we're traveling around, but I think he just felt we should find, you know, some, we should get associated with our grandma and also to get to know his, his, uh, his town. So that was the first time I lived there for one full year, which was very good. And then subsequently we were at St. Monica's in uh, Mampong, mm -hmm. where IJ, hi guys, <laughs> you know, and then we went to Domahin crew, and that was the longest of our lives at one location, okay. where my parents, you know, my mom was teaching, and my daddy ended up at education office, and then also at Doma Secondary School. So I did all my secondary school education up to sixth form in Domahin crew, and that's where a lot of people already associate me with uh, ah. Brunga Hafu region because they, a lot of people think I come from BA, but, but I naturally come from Ashanti Shanti region. Really. I'm from a doomstool house. Ah. I'm a royal from Kwangoma, wow. and that is uh, where my roots are. And so, uh, so the combinations are fine, but <laughs> just for clarity. You know. How was your secondary school days like? was good. Um, uh, very young. I, I, I started very young. I actually got... Um, passed my, uh, what do you say, common entrance yes, examination common entrance when I was in Form 1. I was very wow. tiny. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and so my daddy was scared to send me away. Yeah, and and that time, senior. I passed sec Sunyani Secondary School, and I was supposed to go to boarding school. Okay. Everybody was scared. And Why? Because so, you were so I was tiny. So tiny. I was uh, very, I don't know how, they, they didn't know whether I would be able to take care of myself. Aww. So. And then the next year I passed again, and then fortunately I was admitted. At the, I passed well, so I didn't have any problem going into any school. Did you like studying? Yes. What did you like about it? Um, I don't know whether it's the influence of our parents, but we were all very good. Yeah. I have eight. We are eight. Hey, I have so seven siblings. Busy. With all the traveling, they still, <laughs> they still make time. <laughs> um, you know, we're all very good. 
You know, so eventually, I got admitted to Doma Secondary School. I did sports. I did, I did everything that you, you want to do in secondary school. Drama, whatever, debating team, and doing the, all the introductions. And, you know, they would call you spontaneously to come and do something. But they were training me for future. I didn't know then. You know, so eventually we, we grew up and then... Mm. We came into the system. I got into NAFTI and very, very happy to have done that mm -hmm. because I had to choose NAFTI over going into uh, Legon. Um, did I did that because I, I had two options. Okay. And when I saw that the film school was, was yes, mm -hmm. I actually went to take my, my documents too because they needed the original documents because I had presented it at Legon. And then I sent it to NAFTI because I just wanted to. Originally, I wanted to be a uh, journalist. Okay. Not the journalist, journalist, but I wanted to be a detective. I wow. didn't want to go into military or into service. Okay. So I thought I could do it through journalism. So I can investigate. So investigative journalism. journalism. That was originally what I wanted to do. But I had already started doing videos. Okay. Even before I came to NAFTI. What did you like about the videos? Um, those days, it was just the coverage. Okay. The normal coverage, funeral here, birthday here, social things. And I started using the camera years Way. ago when it was... <laughs> news when people see me holding camera they're like where did she where did drop you from <laughs> you know those were the days and and i liked it because i realized you could you could use the camera to tell stories yeah. and that is how come my inquisitive you know uh, tingles started and so i thought well i could do that from nafti and and i thought it was a good platform for me and because I had already gone into video coverages and stuff, I realized that I could do better there. And the advantage was that in NAFTI, you do everything production. Yeah. And then you can choose what you want to specialize in. So it was good. So after NAFTI, what did you decide to specialize in? I did editing. Okay. But you see, because I was doing camera before I went to NAFTI, um, I also did well with camera work. Okay. And I'd, I, I actually... Um, uh, enhanced it. So even though I, I specialized in editing, people saw me more doing camera work than editing because editing is indoors. Yeah. And so you wouldn't see me doing it. But I go on location, shoot, come back, do post-production. The next morning is ready for whatever. What did you or... like about the whole process? I found joy in the job. You know, I found uh, excitement. I explored. I mean, I go to location with the, the men all the men, and you struggle for space. And it's not just because you're a woman and you are on camera, it's a showpiece. No, you are coming back to deliver. So you have to figure out how you get your material and come back, do your post-production and give it out to the client. I was working that time with video mats. Okay. And I was on a secondment, I went on national service, all that at video mats, and, and then I went back to NAFTI to lecture. Wow. But even when I was on, uh, lecturing at NAFTI, I was still shooting. Wow. In fact, I still shoot. <laughs> Even today. I'm almost... I still shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody. And we're proud. We you, will, look, we will, you look gorgeous, we will make it, way. We will yes, make it we'll public. Make it <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it all public. How did your parents react to the path you chose? I think they loved it. Uh, my parents are such that they've never had that blockage with choices for, for their kids. Mm -hmm. They decide to support whatever you want to do. So when I decided to go to the film way, they were very happy about it. And I'm sure they are proud Aww. about what the we, we have proud. all achieved because it was their support that got me going. My siblings were there, you know, everything. Anytime I needed somebody to hold some part of the heavy load, somebody was there to pop up to say, hey, I'm here. What do you wow. want me to do? You know, so I had all the support wow. uh, everywhere, left, right, center, forward. And at that time at NAFTI, did you have any women you looked up to in your space? The way that lots of young women now looked up to you <laughs> when they were growing up. Well, at NAFTI, there was one lady that I loved too much who passed, unfortunately, Grace Ofoy. Okay. She inspired me because we were on the African Timber. Okay. You remember that film? African Timber is one of those very early Ghanaian collaboration films. She was on that set, okay. and I played a very tiny, 
significant role. What was your role? Uh, the, uh, it's part, significant part, now. Part of the crowd, you know. <laughs> it's, it's very significant. <laughs> part of the crowd. So she was on location that time, and she was actually one of the people who influenced my Nafti drive. Ah. Because she was, in, uh, she was at Nafti that okay. time, and she was doing camera. Wow. And I loved her boisterous ways and the way she brings whatever she brought to her work. But unfortunately, she didn't live to show it. Aww. Maybe that is why I took it up. Because you felt that I wanted, I felt responsibility and I said, no, I want to project what this girl, uh, this lady was about. And uh, may her soul rest in perfect peace. She was such an amazing girl mm -hmm. and I loved her. So she, she's one of the people that I saw out of school, that really influenced me. So I, it, when she was alive, I was looking up to her, some of the things she was doing. And, you know, during uh, my school days, the way uh, our GBC ladies, Doris Koonu, uh, Doris Ansan, um, quite a number of them who were already in the system, who I looked up to and I always, you know, interact with to get some kind of, you know, inspiration. But when I got into production itself, I got opportunity to meet quite a number of women in, in position. Those days, there were not too many yeah. like we do have now. But I remember I was doing the first documentary, Women in Development, where we could count women that, you know, you need to really talk to. Yeah. And uh, that's about 20 something years ago. And uh, Nana Kunedu Ajima Rollins was then the first lady. So I had to in interview her for the documentary. What was that like? Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> it was good. It was good. And, and, and then I, in fact, after that, I got to work with her okay. for, for a couple of years because I was, I was shooting a lot of her um, development projects and activities. And so I got closer to her and we got to know each other some more, mm -hmm. you know. But then I remember one incident, well, is it incident or... Occasion mm -hmm. is not an incident. <laughs> Occasion when I went to interview Madame Francesca Isaka. She was the sec one of the secretaries. You know those days we mm -hmm. didn't have MPs. We had yeah, secretaries. secretaries. So I finished interviewing her and he said, you Nanakra, sit on my seat and let's interview you some. Ah, are you two, you're a camera woman. It's not happened in Ghana before. So you sit here. Then she interviewed me and wow. the cameraman, <laughs> you know. So it was one of the very significant uh, things that happened during that interview yes. time. But we had a very good production and we were able to show. It was International Women's Month yeah, like this. Right, right, we were yeah. able to show it on TV and Ghana got to know that, wow, there are women in different situations that are coming up. There was a lady who was doing straightening, wasn't head off in Ghana, <laughs> a car spraying. Wow. wow, Ghanaian girl. You know, so we went to interview her people doing amazing things, you know, we interview them and put it together just to show Ghana that we are also coming up. But 20 something years down the line, we've come far and Ghanaian women have all oh, so many come up. And we're all great. proud of very, very great. women like you who paved ah, the way Ghanian for us. Women. Ah, what shall we do with them? In, in those days, how important was developmental work as far as telling the Ghanaian story? It was, it was great. Um, there were two sides to it. For example, when we have the opportunity to do documentaries, you tell the story from a documentary production point of view. When you have somebody's work to work on, you have to sometimes listen to the clients or listen to what they want. So as a documentary producer, you may not have full Control. A control over what information you want to put in there. But we were able to tell stories well enough. We did Credit Union, we did African 2000 Network. In fact, we worked from archaeology to zoology. Wow. I remember some time ago we did artificial insemination nice. documentary, and then from there I wanted to do farming. <laughs> <laughs> How did all of this expand your worldview? Very good. One of the things that I have I have experience that I think has influenced my abilities, my thoughts, whatever, is documentary production. Okay. You know, the process takes you through education. And it's such that when you finish one documentary, it's almost like you sat in a lecture hall for a semester or a okay. year. Because you research, you go on the field. Sometimes we do recce. 
we go on the field, do a lot of research, come back, put the story together in the script mm -hmm. guideline that will take you back to the field wow. and you experience the real thing and then come back and do post -practice. And those of us who have opportunity of going through the, the whole thing process. and after that sitting down and editing, that is the best part of it. Wow. When you edit, you hear it over and over again so it becomes you. Yeah. So sometimes I tell people that when you work on somebody's documentary, you can actually articulate the project more than the owners. Because you spend a lot of because time. Because you spend a lot of time on it. And then at the end of the day, you have to tell a story that really replicates what the people want. And they watch it with you. You review and retouch, adjust, etc. At the end of the day, it becomes your story, their story. Wow. So it really educates you opens up your mind, your, your thinking cup, everything, and educates you and brings you up to speed to a lot of issues. Wow. So if you do 30 documentaries, for example, it's like you've gone to school for 30, <laughs> 30, 30. months. <laughs> We're not going to talk about questions from abroad. <laughs> but viewers, again, if you have any questions for us, let us know with the hashtag Breakfast Daily and the WhatsApp line is 0550-585-832. So if you're outside Ghana, the country code is Plus two, three, three, and Nana Hema is enjoying her, mm. her tiger nuts and ginger Thank drink you. there. <laughs> now, how did you come up with connecting the diaspora to Ghanaians here at a time when there were no mobile phones, <laughs> social media? Your show was literally that show that people could see their family members abroad. Yeah. Well, it happened naturally. It happened naturally because I had opportunity to do a course at Radio Netherlands okay. Training Center, Vierat Omro, <laughs> in Holland. <laughs> and then um, when I was there, part of our dissertation, mm -hmm. you needed to do a documentary. So I planned to do a documentary because I had experienced some Ghanaians on the field. Yeah. And I had this awesome, <laughs> would I say awesome? I don't know whether it's exciting. But I had the experience of meeting some Ghanaians who were in the Idrofi, you know those days, yeah. you have to go into, I don't know whether they call it detention or something, whilst you're waiting for your documents to be prepared. Yeah. And I didn't find it interesting. The reason is that simply we in Ghana were thinking everybody abroad was You've made it. Wonderful. Next thing to heaven is abroad. Exactly. Gold on the street. Pick some, send it back. Pluck the money and in. And bring it to send us at home. Let's spend it. Yanfu, yanfu. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so when I saw that situation, it really did touch me yeah. somewhere. So I wanted to do a documentary about the Ghanaian living the other way around. Yeah. And some people said, yes, oh, you would do. And then eventually I did my scripting, everything, plotting, ready to go on location. The first person said, hmm, I'm telling you. They you, didn't you. want their family uh, members so to know. So eventually every work that I did went down the drain because... People have spoken to somebody, somebody spoke to somebody and said, oh, well, I said I would do it, but I can't do what it. What were they so afraid of? I think that time it wasn't like now, and people were not ready to share. And they were ashamed. Yeah. So it, it cut off the whole project, and I had to quickly, you know, re-strategize, get something else to do. I did... Uh, was it, I did something from the airport in Skipo and, and, you know, just to talk about flying and whatever it is. It was a, a quick way to, you know, filling the, the, the gap. So I did that and I came back home. But the story stayed with me. Yeah? It was eating you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the first attempt was to go on the northern route. Okay. With a documentary production. And so I tried, I spoke to UNHCR. Those days, I, this is... 20 something years. Greetings is 20. Most of the millennials were not even born yet. <laughs> Greetings is 23 years this year. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. We should, we should have an anniversary. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we attempted partnering with quite a number of organizations. Some were interested. The preparation was started. We even got a track. Wow. Well, you know, a manual track, track jeep yeah. track. Everything was almost done. I don't know. As of now, I don't even remember exactly what stopped that trip. Mm hmm. So we couldn't do the, the northern trip. Then 
my husband had opportunity of going to do his master's in Chicago. So one day I was there, he just called me and said, Nana, the Ghanaian uh, community here is very strong. Yeah. It's very powerful. So that your idea of connecting the people, I think it will work. So why don't you come and try it with the community here and see if it is possible? It was no. Uh -huh. I was breastfeeding. Aww. I went to the United States, did greetings the first time. It was December because I wanted it to come up for Christmas. So I didn't have any reason to wait. What was our first production like? <laughs> I'm telling Walk you. us through it. <laughs> we didn't have equipment. We didn't have anything. So we took equipment from... That time, Mr. Kowansa, mm -hmm. production. We were using Betacom, those... Have tea. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so we we had to go for equipment, and I remember very well this incident where Mr. Sakita Mishedai, mm -hmm. who was working at Nafti, he was the camera uh, cameraman for the first show, mm -hmm. and he had to pick the equipment. And Ghana was almost left. <laughs> <laughs> he just closed the door, bam, and, and then, the flight started going wow. away because it was, uh, you know, you. You, we went through everything. But how important was it to tell this story? It was important because Ghana had to know that this is the reality on the ground. That was all. Greetings, the fun part is just the embellishment. Mm -hmm. The real story is what is happening to our people yeah. and what kind of life are they living? Who is adding on to development? There were a lot of people who had gone to school, who were you know, doing well, but there were massively huge number of people who were there doing all kinds of things that people didn't know. Yeah. So we wanted to tell the story. People had issues with their families back home, bringing money, and they're spending it thinking they have it all done. But I remember one time we, 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 we uh, interviewed a man in, in Stuttgart, mm -hmm. and he went actually to open the freezer side of the fridge and said, Nanasu <laughs> Omuha. He say yes. He says, that is what happened, and I step in to go and find money. In Tukwa, Grofor Kacho will say, Omu Sheha. Now, next time we discover, Omu who said, you'll be saying, you know. People wanted the reality to be told so Ghanaians get to know what really is happening to them and then they can accept them and they can understand them. Because people were demanding and overly demanding for things that did not exist. Yeah. So it was an education for us, an education for Ghana. And subsequently when the program was growing, we started doing the promote Ghana versions yeah. where we used to go for exhibitions and then we used to promote the exhibition ahead of program and we will go on the ground and shoot Ghanaian, you know, participating in international exhibitions and show it back to encourage others to, you know, do well and also to, to let those who were on the field feel that, yes, they are doing something Ghana appreciates and everybody appreciated them. So we had different facets. We were changing just to make the program dynamic. In the, you know, in all, it's just to tell the Ghanaian story, promote Ghana and get us all to understand each other. So now Ghanaians abroad is, no, we were 11th region now we want to add it to make it the 17th, the 17th region because we can't take any decision in ghana now without talking about Ghanaians abroad but we never even thought about them before yeah. now we want ropa right yeah it's all there and now we're doing back home again so how important is it to create that synergy between the diaspora and ghana and us here and for us to not only see them as a cash cow mm -hmm. but also understand the struggles they have to go through once they get to that place? I think that the understanding gives us the education to know how to relate. For example, if and somebody... Empathize. Yes, very well. Yes, very good. And if somebody, for example, goes abroad and the person has to come back home yeah. for, and the person hasn't gotten anything, we don't have to look down on the person as if he's a useless person or so because it takes so much to to gain ground it takes even years 
people take years to gain grounds before they can really establish and gain something. So if you have a, a relative friend or family who is abroad and the person is not rushing you with so, you know, resources, you may have to now understand. Secondly, if the person has to come back and says, well, I went, I didn't really feel like staying, but I want to come back and settle in. And with nothing, we should accept the person and let the person come. Otherwise, we put so much pressure on them and they will do things they're not expected to do yeah. because we are asking for things that does not exist, yeah. you know. So it really brings understanding and empathy, as you have said, and it helps. It does. It does help. Now, what, what drove you at that time? I mean, you could have decided to do a regular nine to five job like everybody else and just mm -hmm. relax, mm -hmm. stay hidden, maybe work behind the cameras. Why did you want to live this life of service that you did the way that you did? I, I, I think, I think, as I sit here, I think service is me. <laughs> and I am service. Because even after greetings, when I went into culture and development, it's just been selfless, selfless, selfless stuff that I've been doing. And it just gives me joy that I have served somebody. It's like teaching when I finish a lecture. And I'm so excited because I have impacted in somebody's life. And, and when I go into the field and I do advocacy, you know, I feel that, yes, somebody's life. I always tell them when I speak to even a crowd of a thousand, I said, I don't really mind if one girl out of this crowd one day gets up and says, 10 years ago, we had an event at Supi, at uh, Aprede, at uh, Domiabra, at uh, wherever, Kukufu. And uh, the Queen Mothers came and they spoke to us. And then I heard this and it has driven my life. And I'm this person now because of that. One, even if you are preaching to a thousand congregations, just look out for one convert. To me, that's good enough. Yeah. So selflessness. Development, development, development has been me. So I think it also drove the greetings. The reason is that greetings never was a business. Yeah. We never charge money for showing uh, to record. If you're kind enough to donate something to say take car from here to the next, we will say thank you. How but did you sustain never, it? We sustained it by looking for support. And I'll tell you the truth because those days, if we get a flight, and we get a flight those days, courtesy Ghana Airways, and later we were doing or the other airlines recently we've been doing Brussels Air, mm -hmm. you know, we were very happy with the flight to this location one. And if you will pick me from location one and send me to coffee on location two, we were just happy for that. There was nothing like I have gotten enough money to go and sleep at a hotel. Which hotel? We will sleep with people, eat with people, drink with people, be with them, let them feel us so they can tell us what it is. Because you go to a, you know, a community, then you go and stay somewhere, and then you get up in the morning and come to them. And, they can't uh, even connect you, to you. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't even feel them. Yeah. They so, won't feel you no, as no, well. No, they won't feel you as well. So you go there, sleep with them. I'll sleep in somebody's couch, and I'm very happy to do that. And then I'm better than them. No, 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 no. You know. Then they'll talk all I'm day long. <laughs> I'm very happy where I am. You know, I'm very flexible, and I stay where I am. My crew members are all very, very flexible. Otherwise, we won't survive. How important is it for young entrepreneurs, creatives watching us who may have ideas like reasons from abroad to start small and focus on the actual value they are giving the people as opposed to saying, I need to raise X amount before I start this journey? Yeah. Um, interestingly, our young generation is not, you wouldn't say everybody, but yeah. as many as I have come across look the other way around. They look for the money before the service you know but we were we were brought up to be serviceable and so gradually we are trying to encourage them to also get into that we will get there but for now it's become a bit of a story because anybody that i meet that i try to encourage to do something they say no no how do i start you know i need x amount and you know and i'm like go ahead start small and grow it it's, it's, it's the story. You can never jump if you don't know how to crawl. Yeah. You can never run if you don't know how to step. So you take it step by step and you get there. We, we say it every day. We will continue to say it every day. So we will advise and encourage younger girls, younger women, and young boys to go into businesses that they love to go into, but take it one step at a time.
It's very important. Thank you. Wow. Well, we have some messages for you, so I'll read that. Then we'll talk about your, your life as Nana Hema. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning. Please kindly ask her when she's bringing back greetings from abroad. Amazing. I can't believe I'm watching the evergreen Nana Joa Awendo. She's mm. done so much Amen. in projecting Ghana to the world. Growing up, I used to watch her show in the early 90s, and it is a good thing that you brought her to your show. Kudos. Mm, amen. I mean, millions of people. You have no idea the number of people you've influenced <laughs> across the continent. Amen. Nanahima, it's really great. I know her personally in Kentampo and mm. was an ardent viewer of Greetings from Abroad. This is amen. Lawrence Yay. from Kentampo. Hi, Lawrence. Thank you. So, yeah, my parents lived in Kentampo for some ah, time. Okay. So we were there, like I said. Yeah, you've hey. been all over. <laughs> now, your role mm. as Nanahima well. in projecting developmental work and culture. Wonderful. So almost 10 years ago, that's November 6th, to be precise. So we are going to celebrate mm -hmm. our 10th anniversary. Congratulations soon. again. Amen. So 23rd anniversary and 10th anniversary. <laughs> that, you know, 23rd, 10. <laughs> so um, I had done quite some work with communities, different communities. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm already from a royal home. So I did some work at the Fija Kwabre district. Mm -hmm. And um, when we did the homecoming, the DCE that time, Kechi Chichiku, spoke with the Queen Mothers. I think the Queen Mothers were happy with some of the interactions I had with them. And, and it was not just a town that we were talking about. This was an association of Queen Mothers from 96 towns and villages, which is that time, a Fijakwabre district. Now it's wow. broken into to two districts. Okay. And so these Queen Mothers, numbering about 40 plus, came together and decided to honor me as their development Queen Mother. Wow. And that time, it was, it was amazing because the development Queen Mothers that I knew were for towns. Yeah. But because they said I should be their development Queen Mother for the district, I accepted and decided how to, you know, face this adult task. And that is where the development ideas came from. Uh, the reason is that I had already had interactions and even supported Queen Mothers. Mm -hmm. I remember about 10 years ahead of that, I worked with the Queen Mothers Support Foundation and Nana uh, Sewa uh, made me become like a spokesperson for mm -hmm. them. So I helped them launch the organization. I worked with her anytime she was going to events and locations. I had to be with her to structure speeches and all that. So I was working with the Queen Mothers. So I got used to them. And because I'm from the Royal Home, it was very comfortable yeah. for me to be there. But when I was installed as the development Queen Mother of Efija Kwabre, it actually ticked my genes. <laughs> the juices started. <laughs> so the idea was, how do you cover a district of so many towns and villages as a person? It's a very big task. And uh, you know, with marketing and a few backgrounds, I just strategized. And so I worked with the Queen Mothers. Ah. I started organizing them into workshops. I'll bring a health person to talk to them about health issues. I, I got them global access to talk about, you know, uh, how to keep your money, how to take loans, how to work with, you know, how to put money together and try to bring resource persons to empower the queen mothers. Yeah. That is how we started. Hmm. So we were doing, anytime we're having a meeting, we bring somebody in to help us understand some things. The whole idea was after you have been educated, Next time you meet your community, you pass it on. So So I wouldn't be able to do so much yeah. for all the towns. But if I'm able to support the Queen Mothers, then they can go on and explore, find out what is good for their community and pass it on. Then I thought I would have done my development Queen Mothers yeah. job. When I have the opportunity, I go to the field. For example, we started uh, going to schools. I remember we went to a Duman Secondary School, and we had a very amazing time with the chiefs and queen mothers were there with us. And that's when we even started this advocacy of going out into the field. It wow. started from a Fija Wow. Yeah. And then gradually it grew up. We had this amazing conference at Gempa, mm -hmm. 2011. 
and then it was supported by Commonwealth that time. And the idea was to grow the Queen Mothers to understanding um, their role as cultural leaders. So we did uh, the role of the Queen Mother in um, governance. Wow. And that time we invited about, we 10 mm -hmm. regions then, yeah. so five from each region. So originally we were supposed to host 50 Queen Mothers at one place, which was that news. Sounds, yeah. That time. And we ended up with about 120 cream mothers because anybody who had <laughs> Would wanted want... to be part of it. And we said, yes, no problem, coming. And we finished this program and everybody was challenged. Every cream mother there. I can tell you how many cream mothers who have Sussex stories that actually out came out of that project, program. You know, So we were all challenged to go out there and be developing development oriented so people started doing tiny things in their communities people started opening tiny nurseries to accept children who can't pay fees people started doing farms that are helping others to be on the farm people started one of my queen mothers in mama Trato, i can't stop talking about her really went to the field, got a school in her community. She started programs, and she's now doing pregnancy school. I mean, wow. and anything for community she did. She did. Mama Kato in Brown Half region was doing positive parenting. She gathered children, gave them a drama group, gave them cultural group, keeping them doing something positive. I'm sure the stories many, are endless. Many, many endless stories that we have wow. that came out of that. So this is what gingered us all into development. And we decided that we will go all out. And now we have Unity Queens that is across the country membership network that we communicate on platforms. We go to programs together. And we have the advocacy queens who are now on the field working. Wow. Almost every month we have a program. Almost every month we are going to this community, educating, advocating, encouraging, empowering, helping Everything. community grow. So when That's it's all said and done, and you're about to celebrate a very big, big, big <laughs> birthday soon <laughs> that we won't talk about, <laughs> what legacy do you hope to leave behind? Well... I leave posterity to judge and also to appreciate. I like people to remember me as Nana Jawindo, who came to turn Ghana around, connect us to our diaspora, and worked in development circles. And I want to be remembered as an empowering person, as a supportive person, as Ghana's Nana Jawindo. That's how I want to be remembered. If you could talk to the nafty student version of yourself mm. what would you tell her about the journey that she would embark on i think i'll just tell the nafty girl that go ahead and explore i started as a camera person i went in to do specializing editing i now produce i in fact from a to b yeah. i'm not a specialist but if i'm on location and something or somebody is not available i can play the role yeah. We have trained, I have trained people to be camera persons, I've trained people to do sound editing, many of them, young ones, we are still training, we have Premier Media Academy, you know it, mm -hmm. we do series of trainings. We have gone on the field and done so much work with community. Anything that you can do, do it to the best of your ability. It doesn't matter what you're gaining, whether you're gaining or not, just let people remember that if you are not here to sweep, people will say, oh, this place is dirty because Nanajwa is not here today. It doesn't matter the role you are playing. People find some roles insignificant, but your role, even as a sweeper, should be significant enough that you'll be missed when you are not there. To me, that's what I'll tell somebody. Thank you so much. You're for Thank you. Living a life of service, showing young women what it's like to fearlessly pursue their dreams and we are so proud Amen. of you and everything that you've been able to achieve. Amen. Thank yeah. you for having me. We're going me. to take a look at greetings <laughs> from abroad. <laughs> that has our window at her best <laughs> and then continue the show. Good evening Ghana. What a beautiful time to rebound this program. 
enjoy our specialist package with link ups from your family, friends, and loved ones abroad. I don't know, I gotta practice this. Hello! Greetings from abroad means real business. We will engage Ghana missions abroad and the Ghanaian community in discussion. Wow, this is really fully loaded. And we have lots of surprises too. Watch out for the new Greetings from Abroad series. This is Nana Awindo and the program is Greetings from Abroad. Today we are coming to you from the city of Athens in Greece. Mm. <laughs> Born again believers ministry. Our tea, a blah blah blah. But in Chiaman, in Chiaman, Minya, Mabina, Minya, Nanequia, Obedia, the Papa, Koku Ebu, was your friend Bobby. But in Chiaman, the Bab Bobby and Ekasi, I have family, Bernard Bosom Pim, Obia, and Dudon and Nimmy, which are a tonsu for S. Life for also Michel Mina, but in Chiao Koma, my original. Georgina Kuma, Georgina Kuma, Bidin Chiaman, or what you are told to. And my message, I am signed Bonsum, a fellow anti baby, which you are Munina, and my mamma, and my papa, Minianum, Madofunina, which you are a tosu for, which you are Papa Mianum, Mamma Minianum, Bidin Chiamo Bibiara, Yanko Pomo Biahobain, Namepua, near Bethia. Hi there, we hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share with your friends. This is Breakfast Daily on City TV. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7:30 a.m. to 10. Join us for breakfast daily only on City TV.